Hey, welcome. Today we're going to be talking about how to deal with potential energy curves, specifically for AP Physics C classes or other physics classes that use calculus. So let's go ahead and get to it. First of all, these functions that you have with potential energy in respect to position over here, these are potential energy curves is usually what they're called. It's a plotted function as a graph, and we could say the first thing to think about is to think about them almost like this is a physical track, like a plot of a physical track that some marble or something like that would be going on a track that would be going up and down or maybe there are multiple hills, or maybe it's a more complex shape that you're dealing with, but it will help if you can think of them as a physical hill or a physical track that an object travels through. All right, secondly, there is a total amount of energy that a system has, so that would be the total mechanical energy, like the sum of the potential and the kinetic energy, and it never gets above that. Assuming you don't have any extra forces, aside from gravity, for instance, that are being added to the system, you're not going to increase or decrease the total mechanical energy. And I'll show that in a slightly different way in a couple slides. Another really important concept that we're going to be talking about today is that the equation that you see down here is on your equation sheet for AP Physics C Mechanics, but the inverse operation, the negative derivative of potential energy, this equation over here is not on your equation sheet, and you're going to be expected to be able to know and use this equation here. So let's continue. We will use this today. I would suggest you memorize this, but you can also conceptually derive it from this equation over here and end up with this. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about just a couple other quick ideas that you may need to know for your test. And that is, there are three different scenarios you could see with equilibrium. You could have an unstable equilibrium like you have here. Any small little force or velocity will cause the object to go in one direction or another. Down here, you've got a stable equilibrium, a little bit of force, and this thing will just go back and forth, or a little bit of kinetic energy, and this thing will just go back and forth, but too much, and it will go over the hill and down. Whereas down here, you've got a neutral equilibrium, so a little bit of force will cause it to just go over, come back, and keep doing that forever. And assuming that we have no friction in the system, which usually we make the assumption that we don't have friction in this kind of a system. All right, so next up, I had mentioned that there is a total amount of mechanical energy. One way to visualize this is to think about, well, if the ball or the object is right here, let's think about what kind of energy it has. Well, all of that energy is basically in the form of potential energy right here. Well, what if the ball was farther along the function right here, like at this point in the hill, so to speak? Its potential energy would be less, but what would be true about its kinetic energy right here? Well, its kinetic energy would be greater, and the sum total is going to be what it had before, assuming this was released from rest, say, right here. And if we continue the process, like down here, what would you expect to see? Well, you would see a greater amount of kinetic energy, smaller amount of potential energy, but the sum is still going to be the same. And notice we can represent that with a horizontal line right here to help us to think through these concepts. All right. And I did say that the negative derivative of potential energy is force. So it is important to start thinking about the direction of the force on this object. So derivative in terms of a graph would represent the slope. If you think about the object right here, what would be the direction of the force on this object? Well, the derivative of this curve is going to be a negative slope. And the negative of that negative would be a positive. So this would be a positive force that would be applied on this object right here. Another way to think about that is the force is just going to point downhill, so to speak. So the force is causing the object to have more and more kinetic energy with time. So that's going to be a positive force. Another way to think about this is to say the maximum possible speed occurs where kinetic energy is greatest and kinetic energy is greatest where u is smallest. And so that's what we can see visually right here in a conceptual sense. All right, and so here let's work out what you think the force would be if we were given a visual representation of the potential energy function with respect to position right here, and we wanted to visually draw what the force function would look like, how do you think this would look? So it would be a good idea if you pause right here, I think you should pause right here and try to anticipate what I'm going to show you in terms of our force function. 
All right, so hopefully you pause there, but if you haven't, now's another opportunity. Let's talk through this though. So one of the things to say in the notice is that notice right here, anytime you have a flat slope, what would that correspond to in terms of the derivative? Well, that would be zero, right? So we know right here at effectively x naught, x zero right here, we know that our force would have to start out at zero. And then notice that the slope right here, it's very negative, so to speak. And so what you could say is the opposite slope of that, well, that would be a positive value, would be our force. So we quickly ramp up to a large force value. And for during this time right here, you're going to end up with a very large force that is a positive force. Another way to think about that is the marble is speeding up as it goes down, right? There's a force of gravity, a conservative force that's increasing its kinetic energy. And we have to be able to come back to zero here and here and here and almost at five. So at x equals x2, x3, and x4, we know we have to get back to the zero mark for our forces. Let's go ahead and see how the rest of this would look. And if you want to pause and take a look at that, please do so. In the interest of time, I'm just going to quickly go through that. And I do want you to think about if an object had, say it started down here, it had a certain amount of kinetic energy, and it didn't have enough kinetic energy to get out of this, it could just oscillate back and forth inside this gravitational well essentially forever if there's no frictional force. All right, so we've talked conceptually about these problems. Let's go ahead and do a math problem using some of these concepts here. So I would suggest that you pause this right now and see how you do with this. All right, so hopefully you've paused that. If you haven't, now it's another opportunity, but it says, the problem says an object with five kilograms of mass is originally at position minus 5.4 meters, it should say, and is moving to the right. The object is subjected to only a conservative force so that its potential energy equation is given. And the question is how much, how, how fast would the object need to get over a frictionless potential energy curve? So you may think that you have to use this function, but at this point we actually don't. If you think about it, you've got a certain amount of kinetic and potential energy that this object begins with, and it needs to get over 10 joules. In the y-axis we've got potential energy in terms of joules, in the x-axis we've got position in terms of meters. And so you could say, well, let's go ahead and solve for that. I'm estimating the initial potential energy to be 0.2 joules, and that needs to be at least 10 joules. For this thing to be able to get over this hump right here, it has to clear that 10 joule mark. We do some math and we solve for unknown here and we end up with this value right here. So that's how you would approach this problem. Notice we didn't even have to use this function for this problem, but you can do more complex problems that do use those functions. Let's go ahead and take a look at that, for instance. So next up, we've got a problem that says we've got an object of three kilograms. It's at 0.663, so that's right here, and it's moving with a velocity of 2.5 meters per second. What are the farthest right and farthest left positions this object can reach given this potential energy function? So now we're going to be using this function. We start here, but it's got a certain amount of kinetic energy that will convert into potential energy, and so we need to figure out what that's going to be. So again, we're going to use a conservation of energy equation here. We've got a certain amount of kinetic and a certain amount of potential to start with, namely zero. And that's going to translate to zero kinetic energy in a final position over here, let's say, and over here, let's say, because at the peak, all of its energy has been turned into potential energy. So that's why I can cancel out my final kinetic energy. And so we can go ahead and solve for that kinetic energy that we start with converting into potential energy. And so that's what we do here. We solve and we get 9.4 joules. That's how much potential energy we have. Well, then we say, well, let's take a look at this equation again. Now that we know this is 9.4, can we solve for our x values? And the answer is yes, of course. That's what we're going to do. We solve for our x values, and we end up with minus 1.1 and 2.4. So I'm going to go ahead and put those into the next part of the problem. So the next part of the problem says, how much are the magnitudes of the maximum forces that this object will experience? And part C, how great are the maximum acceleration that this object will experience? And where will these happen? Well, we already know where this is going to happen. This is where we're going to have the maximum force and the maximum acceleration. Remember, net force is the cause of acceleration. And so you could say, well, 
right here and right here, you're going to have the maximum acceleration on the object as it oscillates back and forth between those two positions. So let's break down B and take a look at the maximum force. How would we solve for this? This is our function. How would we get our force values at these two positions right here? So pause the video right now. Think about how you would do that. All right, so hopefully you paused or you have another opportunity to pause right now. And I'm hoping that you remember this at this point, but if you don't look at your equation sheet and just think, well, I have to do the inverse of integration. And so I'm going to take the derivative here of this function. I get minus 6x minus 4 in parentheses here. And then I go ahead and plug in my two x values. And I end up with these forces right here. The question asks for the magnitudes of the forces. So we'll call that 11. So 11 newtons in each of those locations. And then the follow-up question, part C, is just how great are the maximum accelerations that that object would experience? And that should be easy. Pause this right now if you need to, just for a moment. All right, and so hopefully you know that the sum of the forces is equal to mass times acceleration. You can isolate for acceleration. Go ahead, plug in your values, and you end up with an acceleration given here. So hopefully that's been helpful. If you have any comments down below, please let me know, and I hope you all have a great day. Take care.